Welcome to the first session for today, our second day of Fodi Digital, a weekend of online conversations about the dangerous realities that surround us. My name's Simon Longstaff, I'm Executive Director of the Ethics Centre and co-founder of the Festival of Dangerous Ideas. As with so many other festivals around the world, Fodi was cancelled just before it was due to be presented by a government concerned to protect the health and safety of the community. So this weekend, we're picking up on some of the conversations that might have taken place, albeit with the added pressure that comes from COVID-19, which is bringing another number of topics to the boil. In this session, author and journalist Marsha Gesson joins us live from New York in conversation with Q&A's Hamish MacDonald. And they're going to talk about Russia, about Putin, about what to expect from the villain that the West loves to hate as the world emerges from coronavirus and isolation, and especially as new US elections loom. Now you can join in to ask questions via the chat box, but for now, here's Hamish MacDonald with Marsha Gesson. Uh, thanks very much for that, Simon, and uh, good morning, everyone, wherever you're joining us from. I suspect if you are joining in this session, you probably know uh, who Masha Gessen is, but if you don't, Masha uh, is a journalist, uh, the author of 11 books of nonfiction. Uh, most recently, The Future is History, How Totalitarianism Reclaimed Russia, uh, which won the 2017 National Book Award for nonfiction. Uh, there's a new book coming out in a fortnight as well. It's called Surviving Autocracy. Uh, Gessen is also the author of the national bestseller, The Man Without a Face, The Unlikely Rise of Vladimir Putin. Uh, and Simon was right in saying that Marsha is based in New York, uh, but that's not where we're talking to Marsha from today. Uh, I'll let Marsha explain that a little bit further. Uh, hello, Marsha. Uh, how are you doing and where are you? Uh, I'm all right. I am actually on Cape Cod, um, so which is about a five-hour drive from my home in New York. We came here um, almost two months ago uh, when New York was about to go on lockdown, mm -hmm. and it's been a very odd experience because I this is the town where my dad lives, but I didn't actually see him for the first seven weeks that we were here. I finally... Uh, we finally started taking socially distant and masked walks together. So I don't know if it's actually accurate to say that I that I've seen him at all. But you know, I've seen I've seen him. Uh, Marsha, I suppose in many ways, Cape Cod would be a, a fascinating place to experience this moment in, because Cape Cod, of course, is synonymous with with JFK. Uh, it really, for many, that you know, the, the sort of images of Cape Cod um, represent the, the idea of the dream America. I, I wonder, given all the symbolism that, uh, of Cape Cod, given all the symbolism of Cape Cod, yeah, yeah, I wonder whether that's brought, brought a particular perspective to your observations of, of this moment of crisis, which you know, the Trump era obviously is almost the antithesis of the of the Kennedy era. Right. Right. Um, you know, I, I mean, Cape Cod is a very, very strange place. It's, um, and when we first got here, um, there was this incredible backlash against New Yorkers going to other places, right? Um, which to me was was both uh, telling and very, very disturbing, right? This, um, in the United States at least, this is very much seen as the disease of other people. And Donald Trump was first blaming China, you know, demanding that the international community refer to the virus as the Wuhan virus rather than the coronavirus, and then started blaming New Yorkers, right? And um, and it was actually really unpleasant here for a little bit. Even though you know we came here, we self isolated, we're extremely careful. But what I find uh, particularly disturbing is that there's no sense that. Uh, you know that it would be smart to start to think to to think about how to make the population of New York maybe spread out a little bit uh, it, as an emergency measure because the density of the city is such an incredible uh, risk factor, both for individuals and for the for the healthcare system and for overwhelming the healthcare system, right? So um, 
And of course, you know, I've been thinking a lot about how this virus is seen as potentially being stoppable by borders, right? You close a border as though the virus respects borders, right? So instead of getting us to think more about an interconnected and interdependent world, it's gotten us to think more about borders and how to stop things at borders. And I find that absolutely terrifying. And I suppose wrapped up in all of that is this idea that, you know, people with money, with wealth, with access to other homes and properties could actually escape, uh, whereas people that needed to work, needed to be in New York City, couldn't and needed to be at the front line, whether it was collecting the, the garbage or working in the hospitals. Uh, did that play out for you and your experience being there? Of course, it's a part of it. And that's, you know, that's absolutely accurate. Uh, the just the, the the inequality that both in res in access to resources, in what accommodations people can make, to, to, to uh, what safety measures people can take, uh, and and you know, in the inequality of the healthcare system, all of this has been amplified uh, so much by this pandemic, and um, and it makes it very difficult to to think and talk about because sort of common experience has really broken down. There are two vastly different experiences of uh, of the coronavirus in the United States: the experience of people who can afford the luxury of self-isolation that we then go on to complain about and the experience of the people who make the self-isolation of others possible. So uh, I, I was, I was thinking about uh, what the, what the com common touch points might be for you witnessing all of this unfold in America, whilst obviously keeping a keen eye on how it's playing out in Russia. Uh, and I wonder whether you could offer us an observation today on how the strongman leader copes with a crisis like this? You know, um, I don't know that I can generalize uh, to all strongman leaders because I think we've seen, you know, what we've seen, of course, is that every aspiring autocrat in the world has used the crisis as they would use any crisis to accumulate more power. So we saw that with Benjamin Netanyahu in Israel. We saw that with um, with Putin in, the, in 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 Russia, Viktor Orban in Hungary, Donald Trump in the United States, and I could go on. But I think there's a difference between, uh, say, a Netanyahu, and and a Trump or a Putin. Right? Um, the Israeli response, while you know, I mean, it's extremely disturbing on any number of levels. Um, of uh, you know the primary of which, of course, is is the the effect which we know very little about, right? But the effect on the occupied West Bank and Gaza, um, which which don't have access to proper healthcare under the best of circumstances. But for the part of Israel that Benjamin Netanyahu views as his Israel, right? Um, it's um, it actually showed ext an extreme extent of care for human life, right? Um, and you know, some life is valued, other life is not valued, but some life is valued. Whereas in Putin's Russia and in Trump's United States, it's all about the leader. And none of it is about other people's lives. And it's a striking difference, and it's you know, it's a horrifying sight. Neither of them takes responsibility for other people's lives. Neither, neither of them takes responsibility for public health, which is other people's lives, right? Um, and both of them see, see, see the crisis, uh, see the pandemic only as a, an opportunity to amass more power and B, as a reflection on themselves, as a reflection, as a way to, um, to show that they're in charge while taking no responsibility. And so the you know, this uh, I've never actually felt uh, since I left Russia for New York six and a half years ago. There hasn't been a moment when my friends in Moscow and I have been so much in a kind of common experience the experience where you realize that none of the things that are supposed to be doing their jobs right now that you depend on are actually doing their jobs. The hospitals are not there to heal, the schools are not there to educate, and the government is not there 
to to provide uh, you know basic services and, and coordination and leadership. You knew that all along, but it's, it becomes really stark in a crisis. And and the similarities become very very stark between those two societies at this point. Uh, so if anyone, if you are watching <clears throat> live and you want to submit a question, uh, you can do that now. Uh, I think the instructions were on your screen a short time ago, uh, and I'll put those questions to Marsha. Uh, Marsha, something I would be interested to understand is whether you, we've seen in the United States the way Trump has tried to uh, <clears throat> use, maybe even weaponize uh the discomfort that some people have with the idea of lockdown and shutdown, you know, telling people to be liberators, to rise up against their state governors, uh, to, to reopen uh, the economy. Has there been anything similar to that play out in Russia uh, with Putin? Because as you say, on the one hand, a leader like Putin tries to show that they are in control and sort of total control, whilst at the same time, it's very clear that the situation is not under control. And I mean, the figures that I was reading overnight were, were pretty remarkable. More than, I think more than half the cases in Moscow alone, that's the official reported cases anyway. Right. Um, no, we haven't seen that exact thing in Russia for, you know, because I mean, these parallels are obviously not perfect. And and the reason in this particular case there it's not a great parallel is that, uh, you know, uh, Donald Trump is weaponizing discomfort and sort of resentment against governors who um mostly democratic governors right who whom he sees as being his opposition and who he sees as directly harming his chances for re-election by maintaining lockdowns in their states vladimir putin doesn't have that problem he doesn't have any political opposition in his country so he doesn't need to do that. Um, but as a you know, as, as as a weapon of autocracy, this is very common, and certainly both of them both of them have practiced it. They have delegated violence. They have delegated resentment. And you know, we have seen it many many times with Putin, who has delegated violence against his political opponent opponents. He has delegated violence to, violence against journalists. He has delegated violence against LGBT people. And Trump is basically doing the same thing. And that delegation of violence. Uh, is 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 a very recognizable ploy and a really scary one. One of the things I've observed from your writing over the years in relation to Putin and the trajectory that Russia has been on is that he has very cleverly used moments of crisis or moments of friction, moments that might bring a leader undone to actually reassert himself, to to build his power, to accrue power. Is there any way that he might be able to do that in this moment, or do you see this crisis as being somehow quite different? I don't see it as being different. Uh, I don't know that he really needs to accumulate any more power, create any more power. I mean, he he has been in power for twenty years. Uh, he um, the only thing he kind of sort of needs to do is is ensure that he can stay in power after his second current uh, and and last legal term runs out. He was going to change the constitution. Uh, he had to postpone the referendum or the or the popular vote on the on the proposed changes to the constitution because of the lockdown. I don't see that as a big issue for him. Um, I don't even unfortunately, uh, you know, in in sort of traditional political analysis, we tend to say that a bad economy is uh, bad for the incumbent, but that only really holds in societies with, with some sort of functional, functional, functional electoral de uh, democracy. That's not the case in Russia. And in an autocracy, uh, a, a real, a, an, an economy of scarcity is actually, actually tends to favor the autocrat because people are on the one hand so anxious about being able to provide for themselves and their families. On the other hand, uh, you know, and they're so anxious that they're really incapable of planning for the future, even a day or two ahead, but also just really terrified of change. And so as counterintuitive as it seems, uh, Russia's 
what what is going to amount absolutely to an economic disaster for for Russia, both yeah, yeah, because just, of the just, pandemic just on lockdown that. and because of. On that point, the forecasts currently are of a GDP decline of between 10 to 11 percent. And I think there's a figure of about 30 percent. They're saying that 30 percent of all small to medium sized businesses are on the brink of bankruptcy. Can someone as as strong as Putin, uh, with as, as much of a stranglehold on power as Putin has, uh, withstand something of that scale? Well, what's the alternative, right? It's, um, I mean, again, that question is kind of uh, asked in the framework of of traditional political science, where we think, oh, bad economy, you know, is bad for the leader. But what's going to happen to him? What are the mechanisms um, for uh, that would weaken his power, or that would lead to transition of power? And I don't see those mechanisms in existence at all. So there's quite a few questions coming in, Marsha. I might tie some of them together because there's clearly a thread here and it relates to some of what you were just talking about. Zoe's asked, will Russia declare an indefinite state of emergency? And in the context of what you were saying about Putin's plans to sort of extend his rule, uh, David asks, what do you think Putin will do to preserve his position? I don't make predictions. That's, you know, that's not what journalists do. (laughs) Yeah. All right, we'll move on from there. Uh, Marcus there asks, uh, sorry, actually, uh, yes, this is uh, from Andy. He's asking about the possibility of Russia meddling in the upcoming US elections. Now, I suspect you're going to have a, a, a clearer view on, on what has or, or hasn't happened in the past, but do you see any signs uh, now in terms of this year's election that there may be a repeat of of last time? Look, I don't think it matters. Uh, And that's, you know, again, um, I'm not in the business of making predictions, but what happened in the United States in 2016 is that Americans elected Donald Trump. It is very tempting and very convenient to blame that the outcome of that election on Russian interference. And it is conceivable that considering that Donald Trump won with a margin of 77,000 votes in three states, it is conceivable that Russian interference actually made a difference. Um, That's not, though, the reason that we have the Trump presidency now. And so I, you know, because I don't have infinite time and none of us have infinite time and no media outlet has infinite column inches and um, and resources, uh, what, uh, whatever amount of time we spend talking about Russian interference, we're actually not talking about real issues. And can you describe what you think the relationship is between uh, Trump and Putin today? I think that Trump genuinely admires Putin. I think he genuinely wants to emulate him. I think he genuinely thinks that uh, that Putin embodies power in uh, in the way that 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 Trump understands power, which is brute force and and total control over a country and extremely high popularity. But you know, Trump thinks the same of Kim Jong Kim Jong Un and and. Uh, and Xi Jinping and uh, and Duterte and and um, and Bolsonaro, he just loves that kind of performance of politics. He thinks that that's what politics is. Uh, I was just asking, as someone that that is spending this time, you know, spending the Trump presidency living in the United States, do you think uh, those perceptions that Trump has of those types of leaders? has actually proved to be successful for him? Um, I think that, you know, what, what, what my new book is about, uh, is, as you mentioned, it's called Surviving Autocracy. And it's, it's, it's a book about trying to think through what has happened in the United States in the last three and a half years. And I use a framework uh, shaped by a Hungarian political scientist named Valent Magyar, who calls what I think we're witnessing in the United States now an autocratic attempt, right? 
And I think that Trump's autocratic attempt has been extremely successful. It is not yet at the stage where it's irreversible, but it's actually, um, you know, he has consolidated power. He has damaged institutions. He has normalized his behavior and, uh, and, and his approach to governance to, I think, a far greater extent than most Americans could have even imagined. I wonder, given what I'm just asking you about, whether you're surprised at the speed with which uh, some of the political establishment have adhered to Trump's vision of America, as well as some of the institutions? Actually, I am. I, I'm not particularly surprised by the damage that he's been able to do uh, to institutions because, you know, the, so much of the way American institutions are, are have functioned is, first of all, dependent on norms and traditions, and second of all, you know, dependent on acting in good faith. And Trump doesn't act in good faith, and no political institution is really designed to withstand that kind of political actor. And but the way that the Republican Party has prostrated itself before Trump uh, has really been extraordinary. I mean, not entirely unpredictable. I, I, I actually, I mean, I wrote a piece about uh, the risk of that in December before before the inauguration, but it's still been been quite shocking to watch. Um, so a question in uh, from Jack, this relates to Russia and Putin. He's just asking a question about public monitoring. Uh, obviously, this has been a big factor during the COVID-19 outbreak in China. Does Russia have a great deal of capability and infrastructure for that sort of widespread camera monitoring of, of the population? Um. So the answer is a little bit complicated. Russia doesn't have that kind of infrastructure. It does have the technology. And it has used face recognition technology for political repression, right? It has used face, facial recognition cameras, for example, in the Moscow Metro to track down political activists. But as far and, and there there's certainly there's a network of uh, a large network of cameras around the city of Moscow. As far as we know, it probably doesn't extend very far beyond Moscow. As far, we don't really know very much about how many of the cameras that are actually installed in Moscow are fully functional and whether, whether there's the t technological resources to process vast amounts of data. I very, very much doubt it. So the technology is there, but the technology is there for selective enforcement politically probably not enough for pandemic control. Um, and another question, because we're running out of time and I want to get to as many of these as possible. Uh, one question that has come in asking, Russia's always had a strong man leader. Uh, I suspect that's sort of debatable. Uh, at least to my knowledge, that's debatable. Uh, but what would it take to change it now? You know, um, I mean, most countries didn't have electoral democracies until, until they did, uh, with the exception of Australia and the United States and, and, and uh, uh, Canada, you know, countries of the new world. Countries have strongmen until they didn't. Russia is something of a special case, but I wouldn't, you know, I, 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 find, I find this line of thinking a little bit problematic, or actually a lot problematic, because because it goes to ideas of sort of national character and that sort of thing. I think that what Russia is living through now and has been for the last 30 years is the aftermath of totalitarianism, totalitarianism the longest totalitarian experiment in history, the aftermath of state terror, and what it would take to overcome those uh, that, that legacy is, some sort of new story and and a new formation of, of, of memory. So in the few minutes that we've got left, I'm interested to, to hear your thoughts on this. In both 
the United States and Russia, and certainly in terms of observing both countries uh, from afar, there is this kind of constant um, discussion about each and every crisis that arrives, uh, which asks, you know, is this the crisis uh, that brings the, the leader undone? And perhaps that's more so in the case of Trump than it is in the case of Putin, but I can think of a few examples uh, where it applies to Putin as well. Do you think that for either of these leaders, this crisis, um, that does have the, the ability to bring them undone? Uh, again, I'm not in the business of making predictions, right? Um, but I don't, um, I, I find this line of reasoning, the, the reasoning that crises bring leaders down, fundamentally suspect. What we actually know is that mm. crises often uh, help leaders consolidate power. And, um, and in particular with Putin, we know that economic scarcity is more likely to benefit him. It is, it is actually conceivable that Trump has done enough damage to sort of the perception of reality and the fabric of society in the United States um, that even the economic hardship, which terrifies him in terms of his chances for re-election, um, but it may actually benefit him. Can you describe from a sort of lived experience perspective uh, what you mean when you talk about to the, to the perceptions of reality? Um, at this point, the United States, is, uh, American society is split into two non-overlapping reality camps. There's Trumpian reality, and then there's fact-based reality. And I think it's hard to live in fact-based reality. Fact people who live in fact-based reality have to constantly contend with the way that it clashes uh, with, with whatever is emanating from the bully pulpit. It is particularly difficult now because we're so we're all so scared. We're anxious about our health. We're anxious about our loved ones. We're we're experiencing extreme economic anxiety, and there's the the orange clown, you know, um, on television all the time. And I think there it is actually sort of cognitively more comfortable to just give up and live in Trumpian reality. And pretend that nothing is is threatening you. The virus, this is the disease of other people. Uh, whatever bad things happen are, the, you know, is the fault of other people. And Trump is going to save you, which is the autocrat's appeal. He doesn't actually ever prevent catastrophe. He doesn't make you any wealthier or more comfortable. But but he dangles this carrot of stability. Uh, Masha Gessen, it's always fascinating to read your work and to hear. Uh, your observations. Uh, we're all really grateful for your time today. Uh, that's about all we've got time for on this session. So uh, thank you. Please take care there in Cape Cod. And uh, and we hope you and uh, everyone uh, around you uh, gets through this, this difficult period. Okay. Thank you very much. The Festival of Dangerous Ideas and Fody Digital is presented by the Ethics Centre. Our purpose is to bring ethics to the centre of everyday life through public experiences, education, thought leadership, advocacy, consulting and leadership programs. As a non-profit organisation, every single dollar is invested in pursuit of this purpose. Thanks to our donors and partners who help to make our programs happen. And you can donate via the website. Thank you.